Focus, the live program brought to you by the Government Information Service via the National Television Network on programs and policies of the Government of St. Lucia. We are happy once more that you've been able to join us and reminding you that some part of this program you get an active involvement by calling us on 4682162. We're also live on WVENT 93.5 FM and we're also streaming on Facebook. And I say welcome once more to my co-host, Lisa Joseph. Good day, Lisa. Good morning. It's good to see that we're in the coordination belt again for the day. I'm very happy about that, Ryan. Today we have promised a very interesting show, as always, one with lots of information. And this one is of particular interest since we had the Minister for National Security, uh, Justice, and uh, uh, home affairs on i think that must have been like three shows ago yes and he gave us some insight into what the government is planning uh, for the national forensic laboratory so today we'll be speaking with the director of that facility and giving us some insight as to what some of those plans are and how the facility is hoping to improve under that uh, strategy and of course there's also a uh, big symposium coming up for the weekend which is of extreme importance to us as well. So we'll unpack all of those things a little later in the program. Yes, certainly uh, we get our program started and we go into our new segment, looking at some of the major stories we've covered recently. The Ministry of Agriculture, along with the Republic of China, Taiwan, has embarked on a project which seeks to reduce the country's food import bill the enhancement of the efficiency of production, distribution, supply chains in the fruits and vegetable sector project will focus on seven crops over a three-year period. With an annual food import bill of $4.5 million, St. Lucia, with the help of the government of the Republic of China, Taiwan, sought to undertake a project which seeks to enhance the efficiency of production distribution supply chains in the fruits and vegetables sector. The project will focus on seven crops with a view to reducing the country's food import bill by enhancing agricultural intelligence information systems, analyzing market demands, and assisting existing farmers and potential farmers plan production cycles based on market demands. His Excellency Ambassador Douglas Shen says the biggest challenge facing St. Lucia today is how to achieve food security and combat climate change. We all know St. Lucian people spend so much money, as uh, P.S. Felicia mentioned, to import certain important fruits and vegetables such as the cabbage, watermelon, cantaloupe and the tomatoes from overseas. The import value is increasing every year. Therefore, Taiwanese government is willing to work with the government of St. Lucia to, re to reverse this trend and promote local production and the consumption of the seven import important crops on a sustainable basis. Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries, Physical Planning, Natural Resources and Cooperatives, Honorable Ezekiel Joseph, says with the introduction of new technologies and techniques, St. Lucia can produce these crops more sustainably, thus reducing the food import bill. One year we imported over one million dollars worth of lettuce. We can. So I'm saying that I have the fullest confidence that we can with the improved technologies that will be introduced to us from Mario and his technical team from the, the, the ICDF um, mission, we should be able to cultivate the crops when they, are, when they are needed. The project will focus on cabbage, lettuce, watermelon, cantaloupe, bell pepper, pineapple and tomato and will receive technical assistance from the Taiwanese technical mission. With the support of the government and people of Taiwan, we have gotten both financial and technical support. And the financial support will be for a period of three years. So which means that this project, for the next three years, we should see a reduction. You hear me? We should see a reduction in the importation of the seven crops that we have identified. 
Coinciding with the launch of the project was the graduation ceremony for the training of farmers who will be engaged as part of the project. The Department of Public Service has launched a Say No to Bullying campaign focusing attention on bullying in the workplace. Here's Julita Peter with the details on that. The week-long campaign runs from November 4th to the 8th under the theme Together Let's Stop Bullying and brings together officers from the Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Home Affairs, Justice and National Security, Ministry of Health and Wellness and the Department of the Public Service. Permanent Secretary in the Department of the Public Service, Ms. Peggy Ann Sudat, noted that while bullying is generally associated with the school environment and the youth, workplace bullying is real. Although they may not be many, they may not be reported cases of that level of violence we witnessed among young people in the last few weeks, there have been some questionable behavior that has caused us to delve deeper into the issue with a view to possibly reviewing how we deal with situations of that nature in the public service. This launch is the first in sensitizing people's cell within the public service with the knowledge to recognize, address, and resolve incidents of bullying in the workplace. Workplace bullying has different meanings of different people, and there are many definitions. Simply put, it is always the misuse of power or position. Bullying can be very subtle or open. It can be physical, it can be emotional. It can happen managers to staff, among staff, staff to managers. The permanent secretary noted that there are several steps that can be taken to address workplace bullying. As an organization, as a public service, what can we do? And I think the public service, I'm not speaking of the department of the public service, but the public service as a whole. We must be proactive in communicating the expected behavior. Create a workplace where everyone is treated with dignity and respect. Design appropriate and realistic systems of work. Develop productive, respectful relationships. As much as possible, encourage people to follow the, the organization's policy on, on, on expected behavior. The workshops will be facilitated by trained counselor, Mrs. Cynthia Alexander, who will address, among other things, understanding the types of behavior which constitutes bullying, its impact on the victim and the organization, and best practices and procedures for dealing with workplace bullying. The Department of the Public Service says the next round of workshops will recommence in January 2020 and will target the remaining ministries and departments. The Say No to Bullying campaign is expected to become an annual activity. From the Department of the Public Service, Julita Peter reporting. Stakeholders in the tourism industry are preparing for the thousands of visitors expected to fog the island later this month for the Atlantic Rally for Cruisers. Janelle Norville gives an insight analysis of the trickle-down effect in this report. Some 300 boats with approximately 1,800 people on Sunday 24th November will set sail for St. Lucia from Las Palmas de Gran Canaria. The voyage is expected to take approximately 18 to 21 days on the classic trade wind route. The ACT offers a two-week pre-departure program, fun competition for cruising sailors and or competitive racing, and a spectacular welcome in Rodney Bay. With St. Lucia set to welcome the ARC for the 30th time, General Manager of the IGY Marina, Sean Duvo, highlighting the tremendous feat, indicated that the economic impact of the ARC cannot be understated. In coming here, I just thought that I would review some of the stats that of last year which were provided, um, which were quite alarming, and I thought I would share a bit of it. Of those ARC participants that came here last year, um, about 70% filled out the form, which ended up being somewhere in about 690 um, participants. 100% of those decided that they will return to St. Lucia for a longer period of time at a future date. Seven million dollars was spent in St. Lucia through that three-week period and 48% of those that answered those had one or more fam sorry, two or more family members on island to visit them either in the, after they arrived or, or flying in to visit them to then sail on from St. Lucia. 
Officials of the Ministry of Tourism, Information and Broadcasting, Culture and Creative Industries explained that the impact of the yachting sector has demonstrated clear and undisputable benefits on St. Lucia's social and economic landscape. Ministry of Tourism, Information and Broadcasting, Culture and Creative Industries Director of Product Development and Margaret Adams explained that St. Lucia has a progressive yachting sector, one that the Tourism Ministry continues to invest in. A number of yacht service personnel who were previously referred to as boat boys have been trained through the Ministry's intervention in collaboration with our other stakeholders. The Ministry considers building and maintaining partnerships as critical to attain its vision for the development of the yachting sector by ensuring, of course, that there are adequate resources um, for the hosting of events such as ARC. The ARC Plus and ARC are scheduled to commence on the 10th of November and the 24th of November 2019, respectively. For the Government Information Service, I am Janelle Norville. The National Competitiveness and Productivity Council has partnered with the International Finance Corporation, the IFC, which is a member of the World Bank Group, with support from the Government of Canada to develop a modern secure transactions framework to enable increased access to finance for small and medium-sized enterprises. Here's Glenn Simon with more. In a bid to improve access to finance for small and medium-sized enterprises, SMEs, and St. Lucia's ease of doing business ranking, the government of St. Lucia is moving to introduce legislation under the Security Interest in Movable Property Bill. Access to finance has been a long-standing issue for the private sector, particularly SMEs. Last week, representatives from the banking, finance and legal sectors, so alongside government officials, of participated in a two-day workshop on secured transactions and collateral registry. Permanent Secretary in the Department of Finance, Cointia Thomas, highlighted that the lack of access to finance inhibits the firm's competitiveness and productivity, its ability to expand its operations and provide much-needed employment. This is important as 70% of firms' wealth is said to be concentrated in the movable assets. To support this initiative, a legal framework and a registry system will be put in place for providing credit using movable assets. The International Finance Corporation works with governments across the globe to develop frameworks that allow borrowers to obtain loans by using their collateral resources to help create new alternatives for SMEs to obtain financing. Elaine McEachern is the Senior Financial Sector Specialist with the IFC. Approximately 57% of the firms in St. Lucia um, have access to finance challenges. Only 24.5% of those firms um, have a bank loan or a line of credit, and 98% of those loans to small and medium-sized firms re require collateral over 1.9 times the loan amount. St. Lucia is currently ranked 161 out of 189 economies on the World Bank Ease of Doing Business Getting Credit Indicator. However, this ranking is expected to improve with the passage of this new legislation. Once the Security Interest in Movable Property Bill is tabled and approved by Parliament, the design and the development of the collateral registry will be the next step in creating the enabling infrastructure to increase access to credit for SMEs. Partner at Grant Thornton, Richard Pitterking, said though this piece of legislation is very technical and many persons may not initially grasp the concept, it can increase access to credit for SMEs. I think many instances uh, there are bits and pieces of legislation that we still need as well. One of them is the Insolvency Act, which again we, we have a bill, um, but it's not being passed in, in, and without that, um, the, the lenders are not really going to get into lending to, to movable assets. So we need a number of things that have to change um, over the next year or so in order to open up uh, our markets to a lot of new types of products um, that will allow transactions to flow and finance to be available to those who traditionally have a problem getting it. Business Development Officer at Axel Finance, Mervyn Aegis, said this bill aligns with his company's model of credit financing. It is, of course, heartening to see that everything is coming into place um, through legislation and, of course, institutionalization. Uh, so Axel Finance will definitely uh, continue in the path that it has been uh, to ensure that uh, our small businesses continue to grow uh, through the use of movable assets to secure their financial stability. 
Irvin Springer, business development manager at First National Bank, indicated that the passage of this bill will go hand in hand with a new initiative his bank is pursuing. We're actually going to be launching a SME Competency Center in the coming weeks, um, which will be providing products and financial services to the SME sector. So the Secure Transaction Bill now being passed will actually enhance this effort. The IFC is hopeful that other member countries in the currency union will be motivated by St. Lucia's advances and consider making this solution a regional one. The, the two-day workshop was held at the Finance Administrative Center, November 5th to 6, 2019. For the National Competitiveness and Productivity Council, Glenn Simon reporting. Thanks, Glenn. Also, thanks to Nisha Charles, Julita Peter, and Janelle Norville, who provide us with those reports this morning that we are looking back at. And definitely, last week I started from the last report we had on Bantana Fuerza, but today I'm starting at the first because I like fruits and vegetables. And definitely, that move by the Ministry of Agriculture actually was really stunning to hear the figure given by the Minister for the importation of lettuce. And, you know, for emphasis, his um, Creole said in Lupaza Fesa Sendidi. So that really brought it home that we really need to really give attention to that particular aspect of our agriculture industry. Yes, and this program, as you uh, pointed out, Ryan, it is not just, as we would say, good, but it is critically needed. Um, we talk about being able to eat healthy. Um, we talk about wanting to protect ourselves from GMOs. Uh, we want to eat more green, um, making sure that things are chemical free. And this is one sure way of knowing that when you go for produce on the supermarket shelves, that when you buy local, there is that extra emphasis that goes into having everything being organic, as organic as it can be. Um, but you're right, it's staggering to hear the millions of dollars that we're spending on importing foods that we can grow here that we used to grow here, that my grandmother often forced me to eat. And now I go to the supermarket, down to the market, and you can barely get any of those foods. And if you do happen to come across them, the price is sky high. And of course, because of the scarcity, you know that price is going to go up. So we need to do better in feeding ourselves. And there's been a whole campaign across the world where the United Nations is encouraging all countries to look closely at feeding themselves because that's perhaps going to be the next big crisis in the world. How are we feeding ourselves? We don't want to have to resort to scientists um, growing foods in labs for us. So if we're not able to do that, then we have to say hello to that world down the line. Um, so we want to be able to generate employment because if we have more food being grown, we will need people on the farms. Um, we need more farmers to get in there so people are being self-employed. And we know that trickle-down effect of, of what can happen economically with that. Um, so I'm very excited to see the fruits of this um, project. And I believe that we've had some degree of success with it already. Uh, but we need to incentivize people as well to get them to come back to farming because I think that's part of the problem. Not enough people are farming. Then there's that other aspect, Ryan, of predator larceny. So we hear the farmers saying, but yes, I want to get in there. I am doing the best that I can, but I am not again seeing the fruits of my labor because people are out there stealing before I can get a time to harvest and take it off, you know. So mm -hmm. these things are very important. So it, it, we have to have that holistic view of what the, the issue is. And the Ministry of Agriculture, I know, they've been addressing all of those issues at uh, various levels. And so the incentives, I can tell you that they are there. It's just a matter of time for you now to go out there and find out what those incentives yeah. are. Well, I love my fruits and vegetables. It was a lot of the focus was placed on that. What's your favorite? In, 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 oh, I cannot mention a favorite. There are too many. Too numerous to mention. Too numerous to yes, mention. Yes, but what I could say, though, <laughs> is that I know it can you be done You tempted me to make a comment, but I'll no, hold no, back. Yes, okay. please, please. Let me hold back. I, I would 
really, um, there, there's so many. I, I, I really appreciate the fact that we were given fruits and vegetables on the surf. But mm -hmm. my problem is I would love to do the backyard garden. I've tried it. I grew some, some lettuce, but I kept it for too long. I got bitter and it sent seeds. So I would hope that I could get the, the other persons who are much more able to time and know about the whole science of it to continue in that way. So your hands are just not for the soil. Yeah, maybe not green. Ryan. You see, you need, you need green hands. Yes. Yeah, but so I, I, I dabble in some and some have been successful and not on the scale that I would love it to. Let's look okay. at it. You're trying to bully me now. Because that's <laughs> crazy. Okay. So I think we better move into that. Too shy. Yeah, we better Too shy. Move into that. <laughs> the whole aspect of bullying in the workplace. I won't say that you are. But um. it... It was brought up and it seemed like it is something that's really might be subtle, but yes. certain people must certainly be experiencing it. Yes, I yes, you know, you know, you know, you experience bullying as a child that carries through you know, as an adult. Um, victims sometimes remain victims or they go on to be the perpetrator themselves. Um, I, I I'm not saying I'm on the fence with this one. I just want my personal thoughts now. I want us to be very careful with how we craft and continue um, because uh, sometimes, um, and I see this as a global trend, and then you know there, there's that phrase that's being coined right now, um, sort of snowflake culture where everyone is so fragile and it is so difficult for you to express something to someone and you have to choose your words carefully. And hell and damnation if you don't do it in the way someone would want. Um, so I, I, I agree that we have to make sure that people are dealt with on a level of respect at all times. Um, that really and truly no one is ought to be subjected to a situation where they are demeaned, um, belittled, and that sort of thing. But also, let's just be clear, too, that when you are coming to work, you are coming to produce, you are coming to bring your A game, you need to be alert and present at all times. And so there has to be a sort of delicate balance of how maybe a supervisor can call upon you to do something and to really ensure that that line staff is getting something done or even a manager you know in, in in conversations perhaps with another manager or supervisor you know so we we need to be able to ensure that we're not going to start a culture where asking people to account becomes a bit problematic that's as i say that's just my personal view on it I am not for foul language. I am not one to say, you know, lose your temper on someone. These instances can happen because we're all human. When you, if you are in an, if, you know, if you have had such an experience, be big enough to apologize. And, you know, the, the person who is on the receiving end should also recognize if someone is being sincere and accept that as well. Um, but I am, I'm not on the fence. I just want to be very careful as to the sort of culture we might be creating for ourselves uh, here with, with, with this one. Yeah. Yeah, let's say definitely agree. And, uh, you know, like the report open if one's probably commenting that probably they thought that bullying was something at school. So I would hope that if it, oh, does, happen at, if it does happen at that level, at least persons who are perpetrating that sort of behavior would at least graduate and find out maybe that's just a phase in life and to not let it, you know, continue throughout their life. So mm -hmm. you would have instances where, it would, when it comes up, uh, as I said, in the workplace, maybe it's a continuation of that pattern in early life. And so. it is important to find out what would be fuel in that. And so I'm happy that this is program is looking at um, how do you address it from uh, that sort of um, uh, psychological standpoint? You need counseling for um, the offender, the person who's been offended. And so, you know, for because people, people bring their lives to work. So there are times when someone may be so affected by something happening outside of the workplace that it really uh, shows up in the workplace. So you may be angry or not necessarily at your coworker, but because you are trying to deal with issues outside of the workplace and you don't have the proper coping mechanisms, it can result in you being more boisterous than you need to be and bully someone. 
So there are, as I say, several dimensions to this, and I'm happy that the program is there. I'm happy that we can have open discussions about things like that because we never used to. So I'm happy we're now able to do these things, but we still need to be careful as to yeah, the sort yeah. of culture we might be in. No well, specifics. our next story is telling us about something that has been really coming around St. Lucia for a very long time. It brings back a lot of memories to me because I remember very well the initial days when the arc yeah. started coming to St. Lucia and some of the issues surrounding it. Um, we are about to get in a stage where the Rodney Bay Marina will be a buzz with yachts of all different shapes and sizes. Visitors coming in, yachts coming in, their families coming in afterwards on flights. Mm -hmm. But I can remember like, when the arc first came to St. Lucia, the arc used to end in Barbados. And it was a situation there when it came to St. Lucia and the first gentleman in the world cruising, Mr. Jimmy Cornell, took it from Barbados to St. Lucia because of the facilities at the Rodney Bay Marina because the yachts wanted to just, after coming across the Atlantic, they would just step on dry land or our dock and there were many states at the, the marina. Um, contrary to what was obtaining in Barbados today, what they call the Korean age of the Korean as they mm. say, depends on who's pronouncing it. And there was a big difference in the other tender and come to shore to get on the mainland. So that was one of the main issues in which the Atlantic Rally for Cruisers left Barbados and came to St. Lucia. Also, the Minister of Tourism at the time, the West Hall, a former Great West Indies fast bowler, he was so incensed by that that he was even uh, speaking about was it possible it was a retaliation St. Lucia but it was just a the matter because the Ronnie Bay Marina provided much better facilities I think over the years that has been augmented as well so we're hoping that you know going forward that this we're saying there's a lot of benefits we can't mm -hmm. actually measure it there is a figure that is given seven, then, but seven million spent yes lost, but yes. yes and and what is actually accrued by having the event coming to St. Lucia which in, in itself cannot really be called it, it really was you know the tentacles reach very far so that's okay. very important also and if it's my preamble to give you an opportunity i did go to las palmas grand canaria how was that for you it was great it was busy but it was part of a bigger delegation i think there must have been about close to 20 of us who had gone on that day i can remember the late chef harry was on that there was Alpha Tisson and, and his group magic circle thing they were called at the time there were other dancers performers and it was like a, a good exchange, Grand Canary Solution. I think this happens now in various forms. We also have a, a young crew that's going over yes. to make the trek back. And there's also been instances where local yachts have been involved. Maybe not as much as I would have liked to have seen it, but it's good to see that we have some young sailors who are going to be taking up this opportunity now. So an exciting time for the yachties and for persons who really depend on those yachtsmen coming across the Atlantic. And I love it that not just the Rodney Bay Marina is the host, but St. Lucia is really hosting. And I think now that we've been able, you know, um, go down to the Den Fresh Fry, the down in Ancillary, we know Groselé is always a staple. Um, but there are other activities taking place as well that um, draw the interest. And so I'm happy to see that the organizers have not sort of um, allowed the, the 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 arc to grow and not facilitate that growth so we're looking forward as you say to yeah. other aspects of the arc developing along the way and in our last story um, featured we're talking about transactions for um, the small and medium-sized enterprises and we know we are business month November and so I was happy to hear this um, as well as would be all small and medium-sized business people because the number one thing they talk about is access to money 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 um so this uh, project will be able to have a sort of unconventional way of being able to to access your financing and to to ensure that not just because i've heard the report talk about the growth and the sustainability of those businesses because um you just you have to keep on keep on and by keeping on now you are expanding and so forth so this is a wonderful thing for us here yes definitely and the stress on modernization and the security of the transaction just about time that we're going to wrap up on our new segment we're going to take our first break on in focus today we'll be back in just a moment
préparation et pour nous nous de manger mérité à chaque proportion, particulièrement à en des as. Millions de conseils qui créent empêcher ou joindre maladie. Faites attention à l'occasion acheter manger. Examinez bien pour voir si dans manger et gardez pour date où mérité pas servi encore. Les ou acheter viande à la main bouchée, gardez pour stand bureau livrer le mort. En menu santé, qui a une qui viande salade examiné et qui est satisfait pour vendre. Pâtiens viande, poisson, viande pour et bien l'autre manger qui mérite de rester à souffrir du pour plus de 4 ml de et bien on marche nous. Lavez la main bien et puis savon et l'eau tiède avant et du temps ou quand entamer viande qui peut conduire. Servez nous sur planche et l'autre bagaille à part pour couper viande qui pas tuite. Mettez l'instant manger tuite en fridge la même après vous servez. Et pâtiens les pour plus de 2 pour 3 jours. Et les ou qui a chauffé, fait à 6 ou il chauffe en pile. Changer, manger propre car empêcher maladie. Ouais, pour caution. Si vous voulez plus d'informations, cliquez bio information santé à numéro 468 63 49. The world's climate is changing, and that affects all of us. Storms are becoming increasingly intense. Periods of intense drought and heavy rain stress farm animals and destroy our crops. Higher average ocean temperatures kill our coral reefs and change the migratory patterns of fish. St. Lucia contributes only 0.0015% of global greenhouse gas emissions, but is doing its part, along with countries around the world, to reduce the emissions that are warming our world and changing our climate. These efforts are called mitigation. But decades of emissions have already changed the climate, and the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere today will increase average global temperatures even more. We need to adapt, that is, do everything we can to prepare for and respect to the actual and expected negative effects of climate change and everyone has a role to play. We need to protect our crops, build homes that withstand storms and keep our drains and waterways free of garbage to help us recover or bounce back from climatic events. Learn more about the Government of St. Lucia's National Adaptation Plan and the steps you can take to protect yourself and your fellow St. Lucians. The seaside is a great place for recreation, but you should be tsunami smart and know the natural warning signs of an imminent tsunami. If you're on the beach or near the coast, then you feel the ground rumbling and a long, strong shaking. Drop, cover and hold until the shaking stops, then run to higher ground. If you see the tide receding further out than normal, run to higher ground. If you hear a strange or loud noise coming from the sea, run to higher ground. If you experience any of these signs, run to higher ground, at least 30 feet high or as far inland as possible, or to the third floor or higher of a building, and wait for announcements from authorities for the all clear before it is safe to return. Remember, run, run, run to higher ground. Be tsunami smart. Learn the natural warning signs of a tsunami. There may not be enough time to send out an announcement in the event of a tsunami. This message brought to you by the Beaufort South District Disaster Preparedness Committee and NEMO and funded by the USAID Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance. If you are in receipt of an abnormally high bill, it is highly possible that you have a leak. That leak may not always be visible. Before you contact Wasco, conduct a do-it-yourself test. 1. Record your meter reading. 2. Do not use water for 30 minutes to 1 hour. 3. Take another meter reading. If the reading changes, you have a leak. Contact a plumber to identify and fix the leak at the earliest. A message brought to you by the Water and Sewage Company Incorporated, Wasco. Thanks for keeping the focus. So we're glad that you're able to stay along with us. We continue our program today. And Lisa gets the time of the program that she enjoys the most. I sort of, well, actually reserve comment on me earlier. I reserve comment again today. But Lisa, again, opportunity to invite our guests on our program. Thank you, Ryan. You're so good to me. I appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> As we were saying, at the very top of the program, uh, three shows ago, we had the minister with responsibility of four 
um, Home Affairs, National Security, and Justice, the Honorable Senator uh, Herman Francis. And he did speak to us about the forensic lab. And so today it's more than apt to have the Director of Forensic Science Services, not the director of the lab, <laughs> <laughs> but that puts her in charge of the lab. Uh, we're talking to Fernanda Henry, and alongside her is Ms. Joy Quinlan, who is a forensic scientist. Ladies, thank you so much for taking time off. I know it's a busy week for you. You have a symposium that's happen. coming up towards the end of the week yes. that you're preparing for. We'll get time to talk about that. But first, let's talk a bit. Joy, Fernando. Mm -hmm. We're very sure. open with you. <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> Joy, we'll start with you, Joy. Yes. And uh, your interest in forensic science and what is your, um, uh, the, the area that you specialize in? Okay, so I am a forensic DNA analyst. And so everything DNA, I know everybody's very excited mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. DNA, is what, what I would do at the lab. Yes. What made you choose um, forensic science? Okay, so long story. Um, I was I'm always I was always a curious child for sure. Um, I always read Nancy Drew and Hardy Boys, and um, I think from the time I was 14, when Forensic Files came on, you know that show, I really got my interest was piqued, and I, from that time I said that's what I'm going to do. And yep. the journey to get there, what was that like? That it wasn't so bad. Um, I did three years in France. I studied biochemistry and molecular biology and got my bachelor's degree. I came back here, got a job at the forensic lab as a DNA analyst. We did a year of training and got into casework after that. Okay, yes. so Ryan, we are smart people. Yes. We talk about <laughs> biology. <laughs> Joy had a, Joy had a, had a good the scientist. Yes. <laughs> I had a great start. She really had a great I start. did. Mm -hmm. yes. And for you, Fernanda, I don't think many people are to uh, you know, oh, cool. you know my story? With your story. Mm -hmm. so my story you. starts. It started um, in ni 1999. After I left the convent in 97, and I I did two years at A level. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life, Lisa. I I love teaching, and I had been teach having a summer school at my home for a long mm -hmm. time. So I thought, well, yeah, I'll be a teacher. However, the summer of of 99. There was a, a vehicular accident. A friend of mine, her mom was involved in an accident and a gentleman who was inebriated had walked across the road and while she was driving in, in his direction and, and he succumbed to his injuries. When I got, and it happened close to my home. So when I, I heard about it, I went to the scene and I observed what was happening there and I compared it subconsciously to what had been happening on CSI. CSI in, in investigations, yes, that show had just come out, it was a big thing. Yes. And you know, and I thought, well, this is what we're doing in St. Lucia, this, this is horrible. Mm -hmm. And because we were waiting for hours for someone to come to take photographs. And I thought, well, you know, because I, I suppose the person was busy doing something else. And I thought, well, if we only have one person, you know, processing crime scenes in St. Lucia, then that's what I need to do because we need more people, you know, to to process crime scenes and that's how it started for me. Oh, it's a very interesting story. Sounds very practical started, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how people get started in their fields. And so now you are here, Fernanda, and you are in charge of our forensic laboratory. Yes. It's a facility that has it has had its ups and its downs. Yes. But certainly the success stories are always not the most uh, touted. That's correct. Uh, yes. So we want to give some time today for us to talk about that. Yes. Um, following the closure, it would have been in 2015. And yes. for, I mean, for reasons that have been quite ventilated already. Yes. Once you got back in there, so let's pick up from there. Once you got in there in 2017, yes. for you, mm -hmm. what was the game plan? Because there's a facility came on board, they were all of these hopes that it would have been this regional uh, star yes mm -hmm. and that then the vision that star fell yes mm -hmm. so for you having to come in there mm -hmm. what was that game plan that you had in saying yes I can see the potential yes. for this facility mm -hmm. to do well well that that was that's where it started mm -hmm. seeing the potential and I thought you know we always think that somebody else needs to come and do it but we need to be the change we want to see and that that was where it started the vision that I had um, for the laboratory was that we can do it ourselves and I wanted to be the one to lead the people whom I had worked with who 
are St. Lucians who I felt could lead it and build it. Um, I, I recognize the challenges. We had infrastructural issues, oh, and, and, and there, there, there yes. were many. We had mm -hmm. our staff complement had dropped from, I mean, to, to less than half. Mm -hmm. uh, the building, we had not been in there for about two years. Mm -hmm. we, had, we were already struggling with humidity issues, so can you imagine not having occupied it for two years? Because you're right there by uh, that. That's water. right. Yes. We're at the water's edge. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 you know, just, just the controversy surrounding mm -hmm. the, 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 yes, the public image that was now tarnished. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a daunting task. But passion took over and love, as I like to say. Um, it was love. I love it. I love forensics. I love the people I work with. Um, I love the field. I love the opportunity to serve and to really make a difference. I think that's what life is about, making a difference. And I think that our laboratory is poised. We are poised as a nation to serve the region. We, we certainly are. So for us to, to lose that opportunity to be useful, I think would would really be unfortunate. I know you did the staff very well and Joy is a representative of that, of being well trained and mm -hmm. capable. Um, let's look at that, the, the complementary aspects now of what the lab needs for it to be able to work and be that stellar um, example in the region. Mm -hmm. um, the equipment wise, where do we stand with that? Because Joy could be as talented as she can be mm -hmm. talented, but yes. she needs that equipment. Right, and, and I'd like to invite you all to come to so you can see we the are there yes <laughs> that we have we have we have top of the line equipment at our forensic laboratory we have I instruments that some laboratories in the u.s don't even have you know and that's probably very difficult for for our viewers and listeners to believe mm -hmm. but it's true and gis will come so you'll see for yourselves yes. we have we have a comparison a comparison microscope we have two gc's uh, ms's we, one is a headspace, the other is a, uh, has a, a mass spectrometer on it. We have two genetic analyzers yes. in the DNA unit. You know, the DNA unit has complete redundancy. We have two thermal cyclers, two um, genetic analyzers. We have, <laughs> yes, we have um, a, a, a trace unit with a comparison microscope, a stereo microscope. We have a fluorescence microscope. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Most of the, the visitors so when yes. other labs come in, yes. foreign labs or, you know, um, representatives of those labs mm -hmm. come in, they are always, they're like, wow. wow. Mm -hmm. This so is we, have yes. we, we have, have the equipment, yes. The human resource is where we're yes. rebuilding because as I indicated, after, 20, after the closure, when we reopened, we started with there were five, four of us. Four of us, yes. Four of us. Today we are at 13 and we mm. have three vacancies that we are going to fill in short order. Mm. I, they need to be filled before the, the end of this financial year and we will have a few more at the com for the so your ultimate year. goal for the human resource complement would be what i would like to have at least two analysts in every Which section is. and how many sections are there so you need to walk us through the forensic lab because some okay. of you we see si junkies <laughs> so what we see on television we know doesn't quite mirror right. real life yes. so you have to walk us through that and what are the different sections Okay, well, I can, st I can start and Joy can mm -hmm. take over. Um, we start when you get onto the, the first floor, which is our technical wing, we start with the chemistry section. So we have the chemistry laboratory, and then following that is the preparation room. And the prep room is used for not only prep, prep for analysis, mm -hmm. but we also clean do up. sterilization, mm -hmm. yes, clean up and so on. We have a, a still, we make our own distilled water, and we also have a, a nano pure. We can make DNA free, RNA free mm -hmm. water. And um, that would be what? So it's water. When you do DNA analysis, you want to ensure that there's no contamination or it's limited as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So the water that we have um, has microbes. It has other things that we do not want to interfere with your tests. So this water is distilled so much that you remove everything that could interfere with it and reduce your contamination. So that's what we we would do yes. yes and then following that we have the instrument room the instrument room has instruments in it <laughs> as the name suggests um the instruments i talked about a while ago we have a gc headspace which we can use for blood alcohol testing we can also use it for fire debris analysis so we we, sh we expect to be partnering with the fire service for that 
Then we have an FTIR. It's actually out of service right now, but we are hoping to get a technician in to be able to fix it. It's, it's worked fantastically. We oh, used yes. it. Um, it's, it's, there are cross units that use it, the trace unit and the chemistry unit. Um, then we have a GCMS that we're finally validating so that we can use for controlled substances analysis. We can expand our, our capability there. We're, on, mm -hmm. we're only doing marijuana and, um, and cocaine now. We want to be able to do more, a, more, a larger suite of controlled substances. Mm -hmm. So it's quite interesting to hear about your staff complement because mm -hmm. it's something I was interested in and mm -hmm. it's good to see that you have your equipment at almost out numbers. Mm -hmm. Yes. quote unquote in terms yes. of the, the, the human people. resource that yes. you have yes within our justice system we know that there's been a lot of pressure in reference to forensics in terms mm -hmm. of getting to the bottom of crimes and solutions and every rate mm -hmm. do you feel that pressure um, when you're going to work on a daily basis or is it something that you feel that you're beginning to cope with because i think that the general public likes to know that there was a mm -hmm. an instance and there was a resolution to it mm -hmm. someone was charged and the case brought to a conclusion do you feel that pressure on a daily I basis do. i do yeah. <laughs> i think um what happens is the lab gets blamed for a lot and um we we're, we we are not responsible for reporting what we do in terms of to the public we need to report to the court and then there should be some kind of court reporting to let the public know where the cases are so a lot of what a lot of what happens is the public is like seeing nothing happening they see um, no resolution but in the background there's a whole lot of stuff happening but there's nobody to report or go back to the public to see this is what has happened this is what we've used forensics for this is what the, the lab has done for us so all of that is where we feel the pressure because we we hear and there are times when i send director messages i'm like what <laughs> when has this come in you know yeah. so we do feel the pressure but again i don't think i don't think it's being fair to us um a lot of the time because we are not responsible to go to the public to say hey we solved this crime it's not our place to do so yeah. so, so basically yeah. you're interpreting the really? evidence yes. from, yes. That, yes. from, from that court yes. and then yes. what happens Chattering after that is out, definitely out of your hands yes. and we right. have to be neutral we cannot be um going to the public and having some kind of we have to be objective that's what we are we're scientists and i think um that gets uh, again csi yes. csi is yes. a little the problematic here and the effect yes. is there um because you see it in csi and everybody just expects the same thing to happen but this is not how it, it works it doesn't work like that i'm always curious mm -hmm. i'm curious about the time frame mm -hmm. that it takes and i suppose um, different analysis of different samples will mm -hmm. take different time periods yes. so uh, walk us through um, for DNA for example because that's the the, the hot bed <laughs> <laughs> right now yeah. when the DNA analysis yes, yes. because as you say in CSI everything is solved within in a, 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 a in one hour, hour. Yes. and I've really heard people unique. yes so and, and, and we I've, I've heard people say but how the lab taking so long with that? You can yeah. come out of that in two weeks. You can get uh, an analysis right. done. Right. So, <laughs> Joy, <laughs> how much time do you need, Joy, <laughs> to, to uh, make it happen? A normal case takes um, at least four weeks, and that's a simple case. When we talk about, you get one profile or just a few bits of evidence, and you process that. So, I think it might be um, best to take you through what analysis is. Um, so before we actually start working on a case we have the evidence come in and we have to examine the evidence you have to literally go through everything look at it you have to take copious amounts of notes you have to take photographs and then take cuttings um, of the evidence then you process it and you try to extract all of the cells that you want you're interested in after and that just just to mm -hmm. hold on just to so that people are clear right the evidence can come in any form, yes. Any okay. form. You could get food. You can get um, clothing. You can get weapons. You can get hair. You can get a hat. You can get so many different things. And um, for within the lab, we're always. I'm always saying jeans, and you know, we hate jeans because yeah, you have to colored <laughs> and dark co colored clothing. They're difficult. Um, so these things, uh, it takes sometimes three, sometimes a day to go through. Um, just looking at the evidence because you really have to 
um, comb this thing to make sure you look you seeing everything um, then we do extraction so we are taking out cells that could take um, up to three hours four hours to just get that done and we're working with tiny what you think is small is <laughs> huge to me yeah. All right, divided so, by a million. Yes, <laughs> yes, it is huge to me. So you're really talking microscopic. Yes. yes. Okay. And then after that, so you've processed for the evidence. Then you need to put it through extraction, and then um, sometimes you have to let this evidence sit. So kind of soak the evidence to get all of what you want out of it. Then you need to put it through what we call PCR. So you photocopying um, the amount of the DNA that you have to get a little more um, so that you can process it. Doing that could tell you how much DNA you have and all of that. Then after you do all of this, <laughs> you have to go and put it through um, a, an analyzer. So you're looking at the profiles and that is where the book starts. It, all of what is, I just said is not very difficult in terms of book. The work starts when you're interpreting the evidence. So like I said, a simple case, something that has just a very simple profile, it's, it's four weeks, it's just straightforward, you do that. Um, but something that is complex and you have several different pieces of evidence to look at can be a daunting task. Um, and that could take probably three months or more. And then after you do all of this and you write your report, that report needs to be needs to be technically reviewed and so somebody else has to look at that report and look at what you have done look at the whole file and sign off and say hey we have done this according to the procedures that we say we're doing it we've done this um according to a normal procedure normal standards and you've checked all the boxes and i agree with your interpretation and we can send that report off so and it does take a little time so equally trained, trained yes in the same you know with the same protocol so that they too would arrive at the same conclusion yes. if they were the ones conducting the testing That's so this would be done the review before the report the would be someone based at the lab or you have to it has to be external we have both we okay. have both internal and external mm -hmm. reviewers okay. okay well i'm looking at the whole process in mm -hmm. terms of getting the outcome that we all want in mm -hmm. terms of mm -hmm. your outcome but you're not investigating no, you're right. interpreting what is brought to you yes. yes so is it a case that the, the synergy let's say cid mm -hmm. they're the ones investigating most likely they are do they know that what is going to be crucial in that instance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for them to bring to you that you can get the outcome that we are looking for in terms mm -hmm. of your, your blood saliva fibers mm -hmm. tire traps mm -hmm. based on what the situation is drugs alcohol pain chips in terms of arson mm -hmm. and firearm residue mm -hmm. so is it that sort of synergy whereby the investigators know what the scientists are looking for yes. and in terms of a particular so. crime and what they need to be more vigilant on the crime scene because when mm -hmm. i look at all that and based on what you're saying mm -hmm. yeah. It gives me a great appreciation of the amount of time yes. it takes yes. to process yes. a scene and why it is important that right. there's this tape yes. around yes. to ensure that yes. nothing is contaminated, yes. the public doesn't right. encroach and that sort of thing. Yes, there, there certainly is that synergy. We work very closely with the police. We, we advise them as well based on, on the circumstances of the crime scene. Uh, or we visit the crime scene to have an understanding ourselves of what mm -hmm. is going on um, and where we may find potential you know evidence so that synergy you know it, ca it cannot be overstated we must keep those communication lines open so mm -hmm. that that we can we can achieve the end goal you know like you said um, but we I think we we have a good rapport yeah. yes. we do training with the also police. With and them. We, yes we do we just completed one yesterday yes. Um, yes, we did awesome. blood stain pattern mm -hmm. <laughs> that was really training yesterday yes. and um, we invited them so every time we have some training at the laboratory I make it you know it's important for us as stakeholders to to mm -hmm. work together so yes. I always invite police and the prosecution you know as far as they can benefit to mm -hmm. participate in training and I think it, well according to joy I wasn't there I missed it <laughs> <laughs> it was excellent, excellent <laughs> training. it was, it yes. was, a, it was to understand blood stain patterns mm -hmm. at crime scenes Yes. Because, because when they have a firmer grasp, um, yes, they can give it, us. It makes, yes. yeah, it gives you some direction. Yes. yes. So do you have within an investigative period that, as, as um, Brian was um, suggesting, this back and forth, talking to each mm -hmm. other, 
um, perhaps the, you know the investigator may be thinking in one direction right. mm -hmm. and maybe if he shares that with you mm -hmm. then whatever you ev whatever the evidence is telling you along the way mm -hmm. do you share that with right. the investigators yes. so I think our evidence unit is is pretty good mm -hmm. we they are the ones um, who anchor the lab and so anything that goes has to come through the lab the evidence units will be um, in contact with the police and they will um, direct them and say hey I think this may be a better um, item to look at um, this um, vis -a vis this one and we, we definitely speak a lot with them like um, director said we do training with the police we do even do training with doctors mm -hmm. because they're the ones who conduct the sexual assault kids so all of that we definitely have a yes. good rapport with them. It's in and our they best call. Yeah. Yes, because yeah. good evidence in. Yes, good yes. results yes. out. Yes. <laughs> yes. But so on so DNA again. Oh, Lord. You, need, <laughs> <laughs> you know, collecting all of that, mm -hmm. in, in yeah. the, all of these samples and yeah. so forth, Joy. But when you look at the DNA of, of a person, mm -hmm. forgive me if I'm not being able to phrase it correctly, mm -hmm. but so you have a suspect. Yes. yes. Um, or you're time. trying to identify uh, yes. a, someone, a, a, someone, a, a perpetrator mm -hmm. in, in, in a crime, uh, you need something to match it up against. Is, yes, is that correct? Example. So how does that work? Because um, we know we, in, in St. Lucia, I think we're trying to collect the fingerprints mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. But going to the database. Mm -hmm. to the database. So that. if the <laughs> database is lacking, <laughs> right. is lacking for you to be able to find something to right. match it up against mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how do you handle a situation like that okay so we have actually found several cases without uh, um, unknown cases without a database as much as a database is very important um, like we said last time we were here it is expensive mm -hmm. to build a database there's a lot to take into account um, so most cases will come with their references and any case that is not does not have a reference sample and it's an unknown and we get a profile we keep those those profiles right but we're not searching them and a lot of the time it's uh, everybody asks about the everybody asks about DNA databases I would suggest to anybody listening in terms of ministers people that could make policy um, it would probably be in our best interest to have something regional rather than local mm -hmm. only um, we have to consider to our free movement of people mm -hmm. so I think if we were doing something within the OECS it would benefit us more financially resource wise to create that kind of database vis-a-vis yes. -a, -vis a database of solutions only because because I, think, yeah. I think people are, are there's a misconception that a database is just profiles yes and people are forgetting that um it's more than that you then have to to do statistical analysis mm -hmm. of those profiles for you to be able to use the database with mm -hmm. unknown right. unknown samples so it's not just about keep taking people's dna mm -hmm. and keeping their profile somewhere yes. you know on file it's it's a little bit more yes. involved and i think i actually think if they understood all of it they would be scared I to guess. have a dna database yes. because you're giving loads of information you're giving About yourself, yourself. Well, to if, if you look at the international community when they talk about um the genealogy and the ancestry yes. databases mm -hmm. people are in an uproar They're like no we do not want you to have this information the information is precious mm -hmm. And it's something that has to be regulated. So we're not only talking about just going and get a swab. We need to have legislation in. Yes. You need to understand what you what you're doing. We need to decide. Okay, if this profile, it's, all the profiles are not going to be nice and clean. They're going to be profiles that are um, degraded. Are we going to still use those degraded profiles to compare with somebody else? Is that fair mm -hmm. to do that? So all of these things need to be taken into consideration. Um, and I remember Dr. King had given a great example um, last time. Your, um, your DNA gives me a lot of information about you. It could tell me what color your eyes are. It could tell me what diseases that you, yes. you could be prone to. Mm -hmm. If I have that information, then probably your insurance might want it and say, hey, you're prone to this disease. We're not giving you insurance. So all of that is very, very important for people to have a look at. We, we're looking at it in a very small, at a very small scale, but we really have to look at all of the implications that it could have.
So yeah. by simply wanting it only to solve the a crime, crime you yeah. are actually it's opening it's a yes. box. That's correct. Yes. Right. Where at some point I may be victimized by the system right. because I have yes. Yes. volunteered. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, so that all of the regulation has yes. to come in. Okay, it is yeah. interesting, very interesting. We can yes. open a Pandora's box when we come back. Okay. And we're going to have a break on the program once more. No Please stay with us. We're in focus. One of the eight universally recognized rights of the consumer is the right to be heard. This means that every consumer who is dissatisfied with a good or service has the right to lodge a complaint to the provider of that good or that service. This should be the first point of lodging a complaint. Ensure that the receipt as proof of the transaction is available. Climat la terre can change. Et ça qui a affecté nous toutes. Cyclone qui a venu plus mauvais. Gros de l'eau et que la prendre l'eau qui a détruit les animaux et plein. Quand la mer a venu plus chaud et qui a tué place qui se pressent dans la gravité. La mer choua qui a aussi changé de manière se pressent qui a quitté de l'autre côté et qui a allé à l'autre côté. Cette liste qui a contribué en petit usine de gaz en espace. Quand un petit pays nous a essayé de faire tout ça nous a fait pour assurer qu'il nous baisse à ce quantité de gaz nous a servi pour empêcher la terre à venir plus chaud. Et faut pour baisser à ce quantité de gaz nous a servi, c'est mitigation. Tout m'a rien changé. Il y a chaque année, depuis nous, tout le monde a la terre, Kaboulé, gaz, l'huile, et que c'est bon. Et ça, quand on cause la terre à venir, on a plus chaud. Ça, nous ne pouvons faire trop même, c'est pour adapter. Fait tout ça nous a fait pour préparer et répondre pour ces conséquences négatives à la cause des changements climat. Nous tous, ça fait quelque chose. Par exemple, nous n'y pouvons assurer qui nous protéger tout ça nous a planté. C'est vie fumier qui est naturel. Pratique quand nous pour abattre des manches en temps cyclone et gros de l'eau. Construit canal pour de l'eau couille bien quand il faut. Et assurer qui canal là par les ordi. Fait tout ça qui est possible pour vivre en temps changement climat ça. Trouvez plus d'informations à ce plan d'adaptation national gouvernement et des marches ou même ça prend pour protéger corps et tout notre cette lycée. Welcome back. We continue our discussion mm. in focus with our two in-studio guests, Fernanda Henry, Director of Forensic Science Services, and also Joy Quinlan, who is forensic scientist within the entire setup of the area of science or forensic sciences in this forensic science services. Mm -hmm. It is before we went to the, the break. Mm -hmm. During one of your interventions, we spoke about the fingerprinting. I know this is one of the, the first applications in the whole forensic mm -hmm. sciences. Tell us mm -hmm. a, a bit more about it because it's something that's common in terms yes. of everyone expect that at a scene, one of the first things that would be done is it's fingerprinting. fingerprinting. Yes. Tell us about the complications of that. Well, fingerprints are unique. Fingerprints are more unique than DNA. Twins can have the same DNA, mm -hmm. but twins will not have the same fingerprint. And uh, your fingerprint just is, is a reflection of ridges on mm -hmm. your finger, mm -hmm. coupled with sweat, oils from your, from your body that we produce naturally. Um, fingerprinting is, is, like you said, it is it's forensics 101. It's, you know, the first, the, the go-to um, forensic analysis mm -hmm. that should be done. I must tell you that we have successfully used fingerprinting mm -hmm. to prosecute cases, burglaries, especially here. Um, the crime scene unit does excellent Wait, work. Wait, pause <laughs> and repeat. <laughs> we because <have> all <laughs> the people say, what? Yes. Somebody walk into my house and look, they aren't doing yes. nothing. Mm -hmm. So just repeat yes we have successfully prosecuted especially burglaries we've prosecuted um, perpetrators with fingerprint 
evidence in St. Lucia. We have a fingerprinted database. It's called APHIS. Mm -hmm. um, it is regional, so we are able to share profiles, share, I guess, fingerprint profiles, quote unquote. Um, so it, it's very instrumental in, in crime fighting. And because it is so fundamental, we cannot, we ca we cannot discredit, you know, the, the value of fingerprinting. It has to, it's, it's your, your, your front runner. Um, but, but the, you know, as, as um, um, Ryan was saying, there are implications to fingerprinting. For example, somebody breaks into your car. Well, it's your car. You use it, your kids use it, your friends use it, so it means that we're always touching it. Mm -hmm. So we would definitely have all sorts of smudged fingerprints all over it. Now, when someone comes and breaks into it, they may leave a print, but it's the challenge is to decipher that print among all the yes and that i think is where that outcry of oh the police can never find fingerprints when they you know when when i have a, a situation of of burglary at my home it's because of that because of the prevalence of all these smudged prints from your everyday life mm -hmm. um you know so when someone comes and and they may or may not leave a print simply because you know, there is, they're, they're just the proponents of all the other yeah. stuff and there. The and the surface, cool. yes, the type it's of difficult. surface, thank you, Joy, is also significant as well. Because mm -hmm. textured surfaces are quite difficult um, to, to dust for prints. Um, so it's important to have all other um, technologies available to us to use chemical ways of, of, of finding prints, not just the, the brush with the, the fingerprint dust. We have um, liquids that you can spray on and you can visualize a print. So most prints are what we call latent prints. They are not visible to the naked eye. So we have to use that additional um, powder terms, or yeah. yes to be able to visualize the print a patent print is one that you can literally go for example if I, I touch the table now you will see mm -hmm. my print and that's called a patent print so you know it's a, it's a little bit yeah. more I don't it's want to make it seem like a rocket science but it's, <laughs> but it's, it's a complex it's a, yes. it's, it's complex it's not yes. CSI it's not, it's, yes because <laughs> yes. in CSI you see oh, so a no, a perfect perfect exposure print. to the elements as well yes that just gives yes. Yes. yes certainly yes. Yes. so rain sun yes. all of that can degrade that's right that yes so, yeah. so what the, and, and that speaks to how significant it is for us to take that step back when something occurs. So if, the, if your house has been burglared, you need to take that step back because now you don't want to compromise your scene by going and touch things because you're going to smudge any print, any recent print that's there, you're going to now interfere with it if you touch. Mm -hmm. So we really need to, to take that step back, call the authorities, let them come, secure the scene or the exhibit as we call it, and um, process it to be able to get the maximum Result. You did say something very significant there in terms of recent prints. Yes. Because yeah. that, I think recent. that's one area that will help you decipher yes. between yes. a recent print mm -hmm. and one that's been there for some time. That's is it correct. how prominent it is? That's or right. Yes, how prominent it is. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Because you can, you can, you kind of see it in layers as well mm -hmm. when you do the, the, um, the mm -hmm. dusting. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just need to remind Lisa before you go to your next question to our viewers that you can participate. The lines are open. And you can call us on 468-2162. We are also available to get your questions via Facebook. Right. As a, you know, we've heard the talk about having an offenders um, registry. Mm -hmm. For the forensic lab, mm -hmm. how much of an asset would that be for you? It would be great. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. It would be. I think it would be great because, like, we're going back to the, the database. Um, Having an offenders registry would give us um, the legislation and the authority to be able to get um, DNA samples from offenders. What you see, what I think most criminologists, most people who deal with crime are aware that most of, offen of the offenders are repeat offenders. So if you have that information, you, you would, they would probably do it again most of the time. So at least you have that information there to reference. So it, it would be a good, good thing. But again, we have to start that ball rolling before. We just call for it, yes. Now, rape has been um, mm -hmm. in the news in, in, in recent days, yes. but this is, it's 
it's a horrible crime that we you yes. know that, that happens in St. Lucia mm -hmm. and most times uh, it, it's underreported yes. yes. um, for so many various reasons yes. but I think mm -hmm. to sometimes they um, victims believe that nothing can be done yes. um, but over the years we've been able to be more mm -hmm. systematic and systemic about yes. how we address yes. mm -hmm. um, rape once it is reported uh, so walk us through what happens um, in in those cases mm -hmm. um, from at the medical point at the, mm -hmm. at the facility you know, rape kits mm -hmm. what exactly happens with the rape kits if you well I can I liberty can to speak to I that. can start the ball rolling and I'll let joy continue we're very passionate mm -hmm. about about mm -hmm. rape and sexual assault and we we both worked very uh, tirelessly to improve um, mm -hmm. our approach to sexual assault in St. Lucia. Uh, one of the, of the things that we were able to do as a DNA unit was to standardize the sexual assault kit. Uh, mm -hmm. We used to have this box kit. I'm sure uh, our listeners and our viewers have probably have seen it before, but it was, it was about this big, maybe an eight, eight and a half by, by ten box. box yeah. And it had, there were like 30 something steps that you had mm -hmm. to complete to be able to take the full kit head hair, pubic hair, mm -hmm. pubic combings and pulled head hair mm -hmm. and pulled the pubic hair. Can you can you imagine that, Lisa? Oh. Can you imagine yeah. after mm -hmm. you have just been traumatized, your your personal space has been so violated that Another someone invasion. now has to come and, and yes. take yes. pull the pubic hair from you. Um, so we were we, we pared it down. We pared it down to ten steps. One, to make it faster for the mm -hmm. doctors to be able to go through the mm -hmm. kit and, and try to complete it in its entirety, because that's important. And secondly, for us to really zone in or hone in on, on um, DNA, the DNA evidence that we can collect from a sexual assault kit. So I'll let Joy <laughs> take you through <laughs> the next stages. Okay, so um, you wanted to know how what happens exactly? Yes. Yeah, so. so the kit is, like um, Fernanda said, it's a... An envelope now so it's no longer the box and we felt that it was important because like she said after somebody has been traumatized and that we uh, already we know that St. Lucia is very small and as soon as you get to the the medical um, emergency department everybody is going to look at this person who walks in with a police officer and that is sad it is it it hurts every time I have to think about it so that is one of the reasons again we, we um, decided to pare it down and um, so a victim sees a doctor, a medical doctor, who has to do a physical examination. And I like to tell the doctors, you are now the crime scene analyst. Mm -hmm. As sad as it is, the victim is the crime scene at this point. And so we have to really look at the, um, the body and try to get as much information for it, from it as possible. And we have several um, envelopes, several swabs that we take from the victim to send for DNA analysis. What is difficult, I think, and something that we are really, we're really passionate about is to try to get that step out yeah. of the emergency department. Yeah. I would love private setting. yes get it to a private setting yes, a get safe space. yes very safe some place that already a traumatized person could feel safe get um, somebody to speak to um, get the the um, exam yeah too. get the medical intervention get the exam done in such a way that it's not rushed because imagine and we've spoken to the doctors in an ER if somebody comes in with a gunshot. Yeah. A doctor is going to deal with that first rather than somebody who has been sexually assaulted as sad as it is that is what happens and so taking it out of the ER would be the best thing for for that um, after the kit has been processed the police get it they store it and then it comes to the lab for processing yeah. now I know you've recorded uh, successes mm -hmm. yes. um, with at least two high high profile I'd say high profile no um, yes, yes. Um, okay. well we can tell you about our successes with sexual assault yes sexual yes. assault yes. <laughs> since we're on the topic yes um, Joy would you like to share go ahead and use it <laughs> 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 um, with most recently we've been able to identify five serial rapists mm. two in the last before before the lab yes. closed yes, yes. Um, between 2012 and 2014 yes. and three Mm -hmm. between 2017 and now mm -hmm. um, as as frightening as it is yeah. uh, because we are we are very perturbed by it mm -hmm. we have serial rapists in our society once and um, and we're not talking 
one two victims, victims three many. victims we're talking multiple. lot yes multiple victims mm -hmm. upwards of two digits in some instances so and and i must add that joy did this book let me tell you um <laughs> that the with with in one particular instance the the cases had no known perpetrator so yeah. the the survivors as we like to call them the survivors who were not who did not know who it oh, is yes. that that assaulted them and that is very uncommon by the way B between 80 and 90 percent of survivors of sexual assault no know their yeah. assailant mm -hmm. so for to have you know an unknown assailant is, is uncommon however there you know this had happened over with several Somebody, survivors yeah. and um, and she was able to to link one mm -hmm. individual to all of these these yeah. um, survivors so those are those are some of the success stories yeah. of sexual assaults and and we have them with you know with cases with pediatric cases kids from three to six yeah. eight we have them with you know teenagers mm -hmm. and we also have them with this there's one of our um of one perpetrator who, who kind of uh, graduated from yes. being being someone who sexually so assaulted, assaulted his, to homicide mm -hmm. yeah so yeah. and we we worked on on all these cases i think the room has has been stunned into <laughs> silence because <laughs> yeah. um you say we, we have serial rapists and you probably figure okay that you know, no. two people are no. No. but you say in that five and yeah, and then you so know well. in that old in the medical field when you then they tell you it's probably just a tip of the iceberg mm -hmm. kind of thing exactly um so five th yeah. that we that we've been able to identify, identify. Mm -hmm. and so then Fran, the question would be then at what point mm -hmm. um, does that information mm -hmm. prevent the next? Because I think cause that's what you, you're, you're talking over a period yeah, of years. Mm -hmm. And so if we knew back then that we had identified individuals mm -hmm. with that propensity or mm -hmm. a, a serial rapist, mm -hmm. intervention and um, how, hmm. how what, what, what happened? that we cannot speak to yes <laughs> we can only but speak I to the I evidence think you're talking about how can we deter other people we use it to deter but other that, that people. information so once okay. you have that information okay. yes mm -hmm. what happens what happened to that information That's at that point yes, it yes. Has so to it had, was had to go yeah. to the court yes yeah. yes so, so i think th i think that with the prosecution then mm -hmm. then we we will understand you know what happened with the case and mm -hmm. and based on i suppose what what the sentencing yes, is or yeah. the outcome of the case we don't know, we even know that we yeah. will we will get a yeah. successful process so these cases are still pending yes wow yeah. so yeah. then but isn't that part of the frustration yes. of the whole yes uh, it is. experience as well because mm -hmm. if we are taking this long right. to, to have yes. cases so yes. the backlog of cases That's in the correct. court is also affecting yes. your yes. own and it affects it affects the survivors too, too. That, that that it affects reporting so it, you know it creates yes. that perception that like nothing you said nothing will been happen mm -hmm. so i just won't say anything even though yeah. i've been well, that's a very stunning revelation mm -hmm. i i knew of some instances when i remember in, in the norfolk island there mm -hmm. were reports of a person mm -hmm. who yes. was like to be a serial rapist right. as well mm -hmm from what you've just said is this something that we should be much more concerned about yes, or is it that yes. it might just be an isolated instance where wo a person yeah. is yeah, I bent remember towards that, that, that yeah. we did have yeah. Yeah. in the north and several women is this something that we should be very alarmed about is this something we should be very alarmed about i think so yeah. well as a as a f in doing this job i am i can tell you that i'm very <laughs> i'm a little paranoid sometimes and um I'm, anytime I meet young people, young girls especially, I always give them a couple of tips. Listen, you need to remember these things. And um, I think sometimes we take these things for granted. Not taking a drink um, from somebody you don't know, not taking a ride from somebody you don't know. All of these little things. Um, I think as much as it's, 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 it's disheartening to know that we have to literally think of protecting ourselves all the time and we're not free to, 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 to be, yeah, um, there are things that we have to, to keep in mind. And I would tell anybody, anybody, it, it, we need to be vigilant. Yes. yes and do. so that leads us straight into what's happening this week mm -hmm. and with the symposium. Right, yeah. So we have a combination of local, regional, international, national. Expo to our own island, and yes. you're looking at closely at the protection of our young people. Yes. So, why why that particular focus? 
It came out of the, the last um, conference. This mm -hmm. one is the fourth the fourth installment. It came out of the, the I think the the audience. Yes. The the, the third um, last year the topic was on sexual assault and yeah. it was held in um, St. Vincent and I think after our two days of deliberation and all of the dis discourse that is um, what came out of it probably we need to go and next the, the step further and go into because children are very um, they're very unique and so we have to look at that even uh, the sexual assault yes. um, examination, examination of a child, of a child is different, is different from an adult, from an adult mm -hmm. yeah Yes, yeah. and not to mention that that our children are our greatest resource. I think yes. our children are our investment mm -hmm. in ourselves, in the future of our country. So we felt that that focusing on children, and in light of the passage of the Child Justice and the Child Care Protection and Adoption Acts by our Parliament last year, it 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 was very relevant. You know, it's very fitting that we can we are discussing this topic. So, now. what are some of the talking points? Several, no. so many. Yes, <laughs> we look because the the symposium is called a medical legal and forensic symposium. symposium. So we're looking at maltreatment and abuse of children through various lenses. So we're looking at it from the forensic perspective, what it is that we do, how our mm -hmm. analyses can help with the identification of, of maltreatment and abuse. We're also looking at it from the medical mm -hmm. perspective. How do doctors see this in their mm -hmm. private practice? How can they recognize it in the emergency room? How do they recognize non-accidental? So injuries, yeah. you know, you come in and you say, oh, he fell, yeah, he oh, he hit, yes, he, he broke his arm, you know, and, and versus understanding what, what, what really mm -hmm. is happening, mm -hmm. um, what be under the surface. Then um, we also have forensic pathologists who deal with the, the deceased mm -hmm. victim, you know, as sad as it is. So they too uh, you know, will, will share on how mm -hmm. to recognize maltreatment and abuse at the autopsy and we we Social. have the legal yes we mm -hmm. have the lawyers mm -hmm. who are who will talk about what it is like for them in court how do you defend you know someone who mm -hmm. is who is on trial for maltreatment and abuse and then the prosecution will say well how do we prosecute Excuse these it. cases to be successful and we also have the the social aspect of it mm -hmm. we have social workers and psychologists who will talk about how do you recognize this what is trauma informed mm -hmm. care how how does That's the yes dr bird how how do you you know how do you approach a child um, who has been traumatized because you can't you can't do it in your mm -hmm. conventional way so it's really a holistic mm -hmm. approach to to discussing child maltreatment and abuse and it's going to be a wonderful learning environment i'm excited about it i can't wait to see you know my friends <laughs> <laughs> my colleagues um in the in the you know the community and i'm excited for the networking i'm excited that people from my laboratory will get to be exposed to, to mm -hmm. these other people what it will be for us at the training opportunities you know mm -hmm. that it will open up um, with the networking and and just just that that environment of learning mm -hmm. the continuing education mm -hmm. for yeah. you to, to learn from someone else and apply it mm -hmm. in it your field I would imagine it also puts the microscope on st. Lucia yes, and how, how we do we things. Yes. are do, doing yes. things yes. here with respect to that yes. so if, if we can talk because uh, like over at the lab lots mm -hmm. of things are happening but yes. people are not aware mm -hmm. um i believe the, the dealing with with social services is such a mammoth task yes. um it's understaffed under resourced mm -hmm. but there's so much going on and the needs are so great yes so when it comes again to the to, to child sexual abuse or just child abuse um i know for certain the numbers are up mm -hmm. so how from your perspective mm -hmm. what is it can be done w within the governmental framework or the support agencies what are we not doing mm -hmm. to holistically address what the situation is on island what do you think i think we're not talking um, yeah. we're not communicating yeah. enough mm -hmm. we're working in isolation and that it's working to the detriment of our children. I, mm -hmm. That's that's my perspective. Um, I agree. I, I, I could agree with you. Um, also, I think what will come out of the symposium 
is that exact answer. So we would be seeing what other people are doing, um, how it has benefited them, and how we could probably adopt some of the things that they're doing to improve our situation. So I think that is, that is I think, what I'm excited most about. Also, it's, it, the symposium really opens, um, as a scientist, you, you are, you're, supposed to, you, you're supposed to get continuing education and all of this. And so this is what the symposium will do. It will open up our, um, our scope, open up what we're doing, and get those answers that you, the exact question will probably be answered in, during the symposium. Since we've mm -hmm. gone this way, it gives me an ideal opportunity mm -hmm. to come in on this, and something that's been just at the back of my mind mm -hmm. while we were into the program, in terms of the demands that you might have locally in mm -hmm. terms of paternity tests mm -hmm. and <laughs> how involved <laughs> is the lab <laughs> and your general services <laughs> in determining. I noticed you're laughing. You I do not know how, yeah, right, because we spoke so much about CSI and then Maury came to mind. Yeah. 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 You're, yeah. Not, you're not, you know, in, on my page. Right. How much of a demand is there on your lab no, to yeah. do that vis-a-vis -vis what you might consider mm -hmm. much more serious and crucial yeah. matters in terms of solving crime? Right. So the reason I laughed is um, anybody who, uh, people I meet and I, I, I tell them, because I don't tell everybody what I do, um, that I am a DNA analyst, the first question I get, you all doing paternity? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm always just, okay. I think there is a demand. Um, again, it's something that would actually help us at the lab because yeah. it would generate um, income and it's because our services it can be quite expensive we can put that income back into the lab and help us grow as a lab so i think it's definitely something that we can look into and um it's we can open it up to the other islands also so we have it for st lucia but as well as the other islands i i, I so honestly the lab think it is for hire well, not mm -hmm. yet, yet, but <laughs> but we should yeah. be, yeah. Um, and and that's the path we're going on. Mm -hmm. We we have to we have to be able to maintain our our mm -hmm. very high you know maintenance mm -hmm. bill, mm -hmm. um, if electricity. You know, you mm -hmm. can well imagine once an instrument breaks down, it needs yes. to be repaired so that your unit can keep going. So um, you know, having that income generated, mm -hmm. you know, will certainly help. I'm, and I'm also looking to use our, our controlled substance testing laboratory mm -hmm. to generate income for us as well. We need to be able to be a little bit more self-sufficient. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, defense attorneys can also access your They services. can, yes. yes. And we really want them to know and understand that we are not a, a prosecution <laughs> laboratory. <laughs> we are objective, we are unbiased, and, and the, the evidence speaks for itself. We, we, we carry out the processes and we, the results come as they may. We relay the results, you know, in a, in a scientific yes. and, and objective way. So we want the defense community to understand that we're not working we're for anybody. anybody. We're working for the cause of justice. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. That's our mission. And on that <laughs> note, then, Fernanda, <laughs> moving forward, what are some of the areas you're hoping that the lab will be able mm -hmm. to get into to give St. Lucia a more rounded yes. forensic mm -hmm. scope? Yes, the, the laboratory certainly needs to... to change the, the the landscape of the lab needs to change our services need to be amended so that we can cater to the needs of our society those needs have changed over the years when we first started and i must tell you that the laboratory uh, the original design of the laboratory is nothing compared to what it is now the original design kind of you know made it like a, a processing facility and we we were able to to manipulate that to make it a little bit more to, to make it make more, more sense, sense yeah. to be more analytical i'm um, so introducing you know mm -hmm. dna and trace examinations for example so we need to move into firearm examination because we have a lot of gun crime we should have been doing it as you know we should have been doing it already even if on a small scale but we definitely need to move in that direction and and i'm sharing with you you know the the plans you know for the coming financial year we also need to move into digital forensics because everything is digital mm -hmm. our we barely use cash anymore mm -hmm. you know physical cash we have cell phones and we have computers and we have you know ipods and and you name it and we're talking to each other um you know from yeah, internationally WhatsApp yes and via Skype whatsapp and, and skype yes so you know our our um, community is a lot smaller because we can reach people faster so we we need to be able to analyze that type of evidence to assist with with um with 
criminal investigations. So we need to we need to grow, and that is our thrust. Wonderful. And we need to reopen the DNA unit. Let <laughs> me see. I, I I guess I I assume that that went without saying. But our DNA unit is is closed in enough. terms of our physical um, analysis. Mm -hmm. So we need to get that back online. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. So we've really learned a lot this morning, uh, yes. and it's really been a really packed 90 minutes. We're really happy that you're able to Thank come you. to Thank us you. today. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know that you're going to achieve the success you're looking at because we can feel the excitement. <laughs> so we, we can <laughs> and they're passionate about Very, very passionate. <laughs> I'm really impressed. Yeah. And With a great disposition. Yes. Mm -hmm. and you know, because this, I'm sure the job, the job it's has very stress yes. 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 Yes push not just the work of the laboratory and the services that you provide and you know that you're very much involved in letting the public know what's going on mm -hmm. and the it's interaction you have with other persons who are going to assist you in mm -hmm. getting a job done. Mm -hmm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this evening in focus, and Lisa, you had as much fun with me this time as yes. you've always had, and you certainly <laughs> had some so great And maybe we can ask them, you know, the, the forensic mm -hmm. uh, um, input yes. on why you seem to be coordinating with me <laughs> even <laughs> without <laughs> communication. Oh, really? Yes. So, yeah, we'll pick their brains. We'll have to look at the genetic science on that one. We'll be picking their brain on that I know you have your suspicions already, but I think I'd rather let them solve it. Well, you know me. Yes. So, ladies and gentlemen, we've had Fernanda Henry, the Director of Forensic Science Services in St. Lucia, and also Joy Quinlan, Forensic Scientist, with us today on In Focus. You can join us next time for another program in focus.